Hey everyone, Yi here. This is the second video in a series on molecular glasses in the Fakrai lab, and you'll be seeing more for the next several weeks to come. The focus here, as the name suggests, is the high stability, or should I say, unprecedented exceptionally high stability of molecular glasses. But with a topic as broad as stable glasses, there's a lot of meaningful things that can easily overwhelm a single video. So we narrow down our scope here in this video, we shall look at why certain glasses are stable. And in later videos of this series, we shall learn about how stable these glasses have been, and what we did to push the limits of stability further. A bit of a teaser here before we start, I don't mean to brag about my research being super cool, but you'll learn in just a minute why I emphasized, super cool, in the scientific context. I want to start by listing a few examples of glasses that most folks know, along with their chemical compositions. Fused quartz is an amorphous version of silica, or simply, silicon dioxide. Then scientists invented pyrex, with dopants of metal oxides and metalloid oxides that increase the strength of this silica-based material. But wait, you might say, you didn't mention what defines a glass. And, well you're right, I'll just throw a simple definition here, a glass is an amorphous solid. I'll go further into the details later in this video, but for now, we know that any solid that's non-crystalline can be classified as glass. In inorganic compounds, there are metallic glasses, and in organic molecules, there are polymeric glasses. As you may have noticed, the names of these materials are becoming longer, so you may want to cut me some slack if I don't mention the full names of the oligomeric molecular glasses coming up. And not all organic glasses have to be polymeric, in the Fakrai lab we study molecular glasses. In case you're wondering about their chemical compositions, these simple molecules here are the glass-forming molecules. When it comes to applications of molecular glass materials, they are more widely used than one would think. We have molecular glasses made into OLEDs, whole or charge transporting materials, lithography photoresists, and so on. But before getting all turned on about how molecular glasses can serve human beings, let's take a step back and learn a little about the fundamentals of glasses. Just like how ice is formed by freezing liquid water, when we talk about a glass, we think of it as coming from a liquid form. Let's say we look at how a state function of a substance changes with temperature, it can be enthalpy or entropy, or something more large scale or macroscopic, for example, volume. We start off from a liquid being cooled down, this is roughly how its molecules are arranged in space. As the liquid hits melting point, the volume undergoes a discontinuous drop and becomes a crystal, where molecules become perfectly aligned in lattices. If all substances behaved in this manner, it would have been the dream for synthetic chemists who are always fond of growing crystals, but also the end of the world for physicists who study non-equilibrium states. Fortunately, a metastable state called supercooled liquid exists, and most of the time it can readily be achieved by cooling a liquid fast enough to surpass the melting point in the blink of an eye. Molecules that face kinetic barriers to crystallize maintain the mobility of a liquid, until the temperature drops to a point where there just isn't enough kinetic energy to keep the ball rolling. The molecules would thus fall out of equilibrium to form a glass at this temperature, known as the glass transition temperature, or Tg. As I've mentioned before, a glass is an amorphous solid like matter, and you may have noticed that it has higher enthalpy, or higher energy, than the crystal. In case you're wondering how different the structure of glass is from crystal, here's how it roughly looks like. The molecules in a glass are more disordered, and slightly less tightly packed than crystal. That means the density is a little lower in glass than crystal. I'm going to guess that you are also thinking, wait, what if we cool the supercooled liquid at a slower rate? Would the molecules contain their inertia such that they fall out of equilibrium at a lower temperature? And that is correct, if cooling rate is reduced, the resulting glass does land on a lower energy landscape, and glass transition would also take place at a lower temperature. So not all glasses are created equal. And since glasses are non-equilibrium states, they have the tendency to approach energetically lower states, spontaneously, at almost any temperature. This process is what we call physical aging. Becoming lower in energy also means becoming more stable. That is, in this graph, stability increases going from up to down. Before we move on, I want to add on just a tiny bit about Tg, because we will be going back and forth on this term later on. Tg depends on the cooling rate, so in our study, 
we define a standard TG as the transition temperature obtained from a cooling rate of 10 Kelvin per minute. Would you be interested if I tell you there is another method to form glasses without a liquid as a precursor? Some brilliant scientists in the glass community have discovered this technique called physical vapor deposition, or PVD for short, in the recent two decades. Imagine we have a rigorously airtight chamber, where air is evacuated, to generate a high vacuum. By high I mean a residual pressure of about 1 10 billionth of atmospheric pressure. If a glass forming material is placed in the chamber and heat is applied, then the vapor pressure of this molecule of interest will dominate. The vaporized molecules then arrive at a substrate. It has been found that if the temperature of the substrate is lower than Tg, then a stable glass is formed. The temperature boundary of Tg is probably not too surprising, since glasses only exist below Tg. But if these vapor-deposited glasses did not undergo cooling, how are they formed? And why are they born to be more stable than liquid-cooled glasses? We can take a look at the energy landscape of this system at a temperature below Tg. As you remember, glasses are non-equilibrium states, so the energy differs along a coordinate, with some parts closer to equilibrium and others further. Let's take a snapshot in the middle of a deposition process, there is already a certain thickness of glasses formed, and a new layer of molecules have landed on the substrate. These surface molecules do not just settle down as us. They are not satisfied with their primitive packing configurations because their potential energy is, well, just not low enough. Before being buried by the next layer of incoming molecules, they have sufficient mobility to undergo packing rearrangements and find more stable configurations, like what is seen on the right side. On the energy landscape it corresponds to the molecules hopping between energy wells to locate a more globalized local minimum. As more molecules become happier with where they are sitting, the overall glass becomes more stable. Well I admit that was probably the most fictional narrative I've ever made in a scientific presentation, so let's be a little more professional and technical. We'll bring up this energy versus temperature plot, and we also want to recall that the lower we go on the y-axis, the more stable a glass is. I'll directly pinpoint where vapor deposited glasses are located, it is somewhere lower than liquid quenched glass. It takes as many as thousands of years of physical aging for a liquid quenched glass to get there. I'll also simplify this figure a little bit, so with what's remaining, here's a question, how do we measure stability, or quantify stability? Obviously, we cannot note the absolute value of enthalpy or entropy, so we can boil down to looking at something measurable, like volume. If you're thinking about comparing the difference in volume between PVD glass and liquid quenched glass, you're on the right track. And if this volume difference is normalized against the volume of a standard liquid quenched glass, then we can get a relative density increase, exactly what we need for a figure of merit. This is how we do it experimentally. We can heat the vapor deposited glass to a temperature above Tg, where the stable packing configurations are broken apart and the glass becomes a supercooled liquid, then cool back down to room temperature to form a liquid quenched glass. As simple as that, true story. And that's a good place to stop this video. If you're interested in learning more about stable molecular glasses, we'll meet up in the next video.